All right, everybody. So I like to give a few, just a, a minute up front just to get everybody in the room. Uh, I know it takes a minute for everybody connected to their um, sound and um, all of that. Give just another second here. All right. Okay, so uh, welcome to our to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research Education Webinar, Introduction to Sarcoidosis. I'm Mindy Buchanan, the Director of Patient Programs, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, first, I would like to thank our sponsor, our awareness sponsor this year, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, for their continuing support of our programming and awareness education programming this year. Thank you to Mallinckrodt. Um, and next, I'd like to actually go over some housekeeping for the webinar today. So as you guys know, this is a webinar. We are not able to see or hear audience members. This means that if you use the hand raise function, we'll not be able to respond directly. The chat feature works only as a direct message to speakers and moderators. So feel free to use this if you'd like to chat directly to one of us. Um, I'll be able to chat with the audience and that's where I'll add links and any links that are discussed during this session. Um, and we'll also send out the links in the post event email. Uh, you may send your questions throughout the webinar directly or add them to the Q&A feature. Um, you have the option of submitting questions anonymously as well if you'd like, if you'd prefer that. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please chat me directly and I'll do what I can to help. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our experts for today's webinar. Uh, first, we have Dr. Manny Ribeiro. Dr. Ribeiro earned his MD uh, degree in Brazil at the Federal University of, oh gosh, I hope I don't ruin this, Bahia. <laughs> um, he completed his residency in internal medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital at University of Miami in Miami, Florida. And Dr. Ribeiro completed three years of pulmonary and critical care fellowship training at the Cleveland Clinic. Since 2020, Dr. Ribeiro has served as the director of the sarcoidosis center in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at Cleveland Clinic. His main clinical and research focuses are aimed at making continued contributions to the field of sarcoidosis and neurosecretions. Dr. Ribeiro is considered a sarcoidosis generalist and oversees patients with multi-organ involvement. Next, we have Dr. Hema Vidula. Dr. Vidula is an associate professor of medicine and an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist at the University of Rochester in New York. Dr. Vidula received her MD degree from Northwestern University and completed her residency uh, cardiovascular disease and advanced heart failure fellowships at Northwestern. She is the medical director of heart transplant as well as a co-director of the comprehensive sarcoidosis and amyloidosis programs. Dr. Vidula has a special interest in telehealth and has received multiple research grants for prospective studies in patients with left ventricle ventricular assisted devices. <laughs> Dr. Vidula is also the governor of, uh, governor of the New York State chapter of the American College of Cardiology. And we also have Dr. Brandon Moss. Dr. Moss is an associate staff neurologist at Cleveland Clinic Sarcoidosis Center. He received his medical degree from the University of Texas Science Center at San Antonio and completed his neurology residency at the University of Michigan. He completed neuroimmunology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Mellon Center and a master's degree in clinical research from Case Western Reserve University. Whew, okay, with that, our prestigious experts, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is my pleasure to actually hand over the, the driving credentials to Dr. Ribeiro, um, who will take us through his section, and then uh, we'll move on to Dr. Vadula and the Dr. Moss, and then we'll have a Q&A after that. So, Dr. Ribeiro, welcome. Andy, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for the invite, and thank you, FSR, as well. Thank you, all the participants, for joining. Hopefully, this will be uh, fun, uh, interactive with the Q&A and, and very helpful for you. Uh, the first thing that I have to try to do is to share my screen. So let's see how successful I am here. And uh, OK, Mindy, can you see the uh, can you see the slide there? I can. Very good. Perfect. So thank you, uh, everybody. Again, we'll, we'll start uh, doing a little overview of sarcoidosis, and then I'll focus a little bit also on the pulmonary aspect of the disease. Um, I always like to start with a definition of the disease, right? So what is sarcoidosis? And I still find very useful this definition from 1999 from the guidelines from the ATS, CRS, and WASOC societies. 
for two main reasons. Uh, one, it still stresses the importance that sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease, right? So even though sometimes we focus on the lungs, on the heart, on the neurologic system, uh, this is still a disease that can affect your whole body and we have to be mindful of that. Um, the second thing that it's very important is this definition still stresses the importance of finding non-caseating or non-necrotizing granulomas in the biopsy, right? So sometimes we can make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis without a biopsy, but most of the time, uh, this biopsy showing granulomas is very important. Um, and here is the granuloma, right? So, so I told you that this is very important in the disease. So let's take a deeper look at this granuloma, what it is, how is it formed, right? And uh, you'll see that this is important even for treatment, some medications that we choose. So here in the right side, you see the granuloma. In the center of the granuloma, uh, you have those cells called the histiocytes. And those cells, they get together and they form here those giant cells, you know, those big cells with a lot of nuclei. And around the center, you have a lot of lymphocytes, specifically T lymphocytes. So this is the granuloma. This is what defines sarcoidosis under the microscope. Of course, a lot of other diseases can cause granuloma too, but once you exclude all of those other issues, you make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. But how is that granuloma formed, right? This is very important to understand the disease and, and even uh, more importantly to treat you. As you can see here, a very important molecule is TNF or tumor necrosis factor alpha. This causes activation and multiplication of those granulomas. So we actually try to target this molecule to block this molecule with some of the medications that we use. But even before that, there are some other important steps too. So as you can see here in the left-hand side, uh, we believe nowadays, based on, uh, on, on research that is available, that everything starts with uh, some trigger in the environment. We don't know what that trigger is. In fact, you'll see in the next slide that there are many possible culprits, but this is what we believe, you know, the first step in this, in this uh, uh, reaction. Once uh, you are exposed to that trigger in the environment, uh, cells like uh, uh, antigen presenting cells present the antigen to the lymphocytes, to the T lymphocytes, especially CD4 positive lymphocytes. And they do so through those uh, uh, receptors here, the HLA class 2 receptors. So after those antigens are presented, then those uh, CD4 positive lymphocytes start their reaction with a lot of different cytokines like IL2, interferon gamma. Uh, but as I mentioned, the TNF alpha is one of the most important ones. This CD4 positive uh, lymphocyte is so important in sarcoidosis. So some of you or most of you may have heard of this already. When we do bronchoscopy and we do uh, a bronchial velar lavage to try to make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, we, we can actually measure how many CD4 positive lymphocytes, CD4 positive lymphocytes you have uh, uh, in your lungs. And this helps us in making this diagnosis. So I showed you a little bit how the granuloma is formed. I, I, I told you that uh, um, it all starts with uh, uh, some type of trigger in the environment. So I do wanna show you this other picture again. This is a busy picture. We don't need to go through all of this, but it's a very recent picture uh, 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 from a, a nice review in one of the major journals in medicine, a New England Journal of Medicine. And the reason I wanted to show you this here is because it emphasizes the importance of environmental or occupational exposure. And uh, here are some of those exposures that have been associated with sarcoidosis. As I, as I told you a, a, a few seconds ago, we still don't know uh, if there's one specific antigen that causes this. In fact, we think that m there are a lot of possible culprits. So molding environments is one of them, working with insecticides, that's another one metal exposure, firefighters, dust. A lot of those things have been associated with a sarcoidosis in many studies. And even uh, infectious agents like mycobacteria or cutibacterium acnes, some of, some of those antigens have been uh, associated with sarcoidosis in some of those studies. Do we know for sure if one of those antigens causes sarcoidosis? Not really, those are all hypotheses, but we do think that uh, you know because of all of those different uh, 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 research studies, we do believe that this 
reaction that starts from this exposure. Uh, the other reason why I think this picture is important is it also stresses the relevance of the uh, relationship between the environment and the genetic predisposition, right? So there is some genetic predisposition in sarcoidosis. And when this, those two things are linked, the environment and the genes, that's when you develop the disease. Uh, as you can see here, some patients will form granuloma, will have uh, 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 persistence of the disease, but for some reasons that we don't know, some patients will get better, this granuloma will be dissolved and, and the disease will be resolved. Moving on a little bit to prevalence. So now that you know what is sarcoidosis, what is that granuloma, how often does that happen? And this is a recent study here from the US showing that the prevalence of sarcoidosis is 60 per 100,000 people. But as you can see here, you can see it can be even three times higher in African-American female, right? Up to 180 uh, cases per 100,000. It happens uh, similarly across the US, except for a lower prevalence in the West uh, side of the US. We don't know exactly why is that, uh, but otherwise pretty similar prevalence uh, across the US. And another very important point from that study, again, a recent study looking at thousands of patients with sarcoidosis in the US. Before this study, we thought that sarcoidosis was a disease of, of mainly like very young people, right? Uh, 20s, 30s. Uh, but this study changed the way we see this. As you can see here, under new cases, more than 50% of the new cases were happening in patients 55 uh, years uh, of age or older. So, so this study really changed how we see things, how we teach about sarcoidosis, how we see those patients. Sarcoidosis can happen in any, any uh, uh, age group. And when it happens, as I mentioned to you, and as you know, uh, it can affect your whole body, right? Again, we, I'll focus on pulmonary today. You'll see talks about heart and, 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 and the nerve system, but it can really affect your whole body uh, and it can cause a lot of different symptoms depending on what organ is being affected. But the other important thing is uh, some of the most common symptoms that patients have uh, that can affect quality of life quite significantly, as you know, like fatigue, pain, concentration problem, memory problems, brain fog, right? Some of those things are not related to a specific organ, but we have to pay attention to those. We have to help our patients uh, get better uh, from those symptoms as well. And now we'll focus a little bit on pulmonary sarcoidosis. I'm showing you here two x-rays, uh, just to show you how different this disease can be in different patients. Um, to the left here, you'll see a patient with normal lungs. So this is an x-ray showing a normal uh, 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 right lung, a normal left lung, but there is a lot of lymph gland, lymph node involvement in the chest. We call this stage one or scatting stage, staging system uh, uh, one. Scatting was a physician uh, 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 from England that in the 1960s developed this, uh, this staging and we still use that because it's still important. Uh, but this is a patient with the stage one uh, sarcoidosis in the lungs. To the right here, you see a completely different uh, chest X-ray with no lymph gland involvement. You don't see enlargement of those lymph glands in the chest but you see a lot of the scar tissue. And then we call this scatting stage system four. This only applies to pulmonary sarcoidosis. This only applies to chest X-ray. We don't use those, nerve, those uh, terms, uh, for example, when we look at a CAT scan. But CAT scans are very important too, as you know. So those are more recent, uh, it's a more recent technology. We see a, a lot of uh, a detailed image of the lungs. And uh, we see a lot of different types of uh, manifestations of sarcoidosis as well. So I'm showing you here just a few of them. Uh, to the, in the upper left here, you see lymph glands in the chest, lymph nodes in the chest around the trachea, this ear pipe right here. This is the common, most common type of, of pulmonary sarcoidosis. When you have sarcoidosis, only those lymph glands. On the bottom here, you see lung nodules or pulmonary nodules. Some of those extra dots and lines here are normal, but here, especially in this area, you see too many of those white dots. So those extra dots are abnormal. Here you see some abnormal extra dots as well. Those are pulmonary nodules. And the, the pattern of that nodule is important too. For example, 
This type right here is what we call a perilymphatic nodule because those nodules are touching the pleura, that membrane around the lung. And this is the most common type of lung nodule that you can have. So when we see a CT scan like this, we are thinking, well, this is most likely sarcoidosis because this type of nodule is very common. In the upper right here, you also see a lot of lung nodules, a lot of those extra dots, but it's a different pattern. We call this centrilobular pattern. As you can see, the uh, pleural line does not have any of those spots. This is a, a less common type of lung nodule that we see in sarcoidosis, but we do see that as well. So this is a patient with sarcoidosis in a less common type of uh, lung nodules. On the bottom here, you see scar tissue. Uh, so no nodules, no lymph glands, but scar tissue in the lungs, pulmonary fibrosis. So we see that in sarcoidosis as well. So as you can see here, a lot of different types of manifestations from this disease um, uh, in the lungs. Now, if you suspect sarcoidosis, if we think you have sarcoidosis, the best way nowadays to make that diagnosis is really to do a biopsy. Uh, so here is a type of biopsy that we do of the lymph glands uh, using this endobronchial ultrasound or EBUS. It's a very minimally invasive technique, a very low risk of complications, and we can see those granulomas here. Uh, so again, even though sometimes we can make the diagnosis without a biopsy, most of the time we are trying to reach those lymph glands, make a diagnosis or, or do lung biopsies uh, 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 to confirm that you have pulmonary sarcoidosis. Once we know that you have the disease, we have to make a decision about treatment. And uh, this is a very nice study showing that not everybody with sarcoidosis needs treatment. Sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease. So as you can see here in pulmonary sarcoidosis, only half of the patients require treatment in this study. So we really, we really have to be doing this exercise with you, with patients, making this decision together in clinic. Do we need uh, treatment? Uh, is the benefit worth the risk? If we decide that yes, treatment is needed, here's a good scheme of uh, how we treat patients with sarcoidosis. First line, steroids. The only benefit of steroids is that it's the fastest medication that we have. But as you'll see in a few uh, slides, there are a lot of potential side effects. Second line, those are all good options. Methotrexate, azathioprine, flunamide, all of those are good options to treat sarcoidosis. But if you have a severe case of sarcoidosis or if you're not getting better with those uh, other options, then we go with the third line agents, inflic infliximab, adalimumab. Those are medications that block the TNF alpha, the tumor necrosis factor alpha that is very important in this disease. Uh, bes uh, outside of those uh, more established uh, medications, uh, we can try a lot of uh, other options. We call those fourth line agents, uh, but you know there are less studies with those uh, uh, medications, so uh, that's why they're not here in, uh, in those slides. But a lot of times we have to use uh, those fourth line agents because none of those first options worked. If we decide to use the steroids, again, the main benefit of, of prednisone or steroids is that it works fast. And here's one study that summarized the benefit of using the steroids in pulmonary sarcoidosis. Basically, chest x-ray got better after two years. You have here some numbers to show how significant that improvement was. Um, and a, a very important number is this number needed to treat of four. That means that for every four patients that we treat with the steroids, one patient got better. Uh, so this is the you know, summary of the data uh, uh, showing the benefits of steroids. Not many, as you can see, right? So not a lot of uh, studies uh, proving that steroids is, is beneficial, but you know, we still use it based on those uh, smaller studies and expert opinion. The problem with the steroids is there are a lot of potential side effects. So this is a study from our group uh, showing that just by being on steroids, regardless of the dose, this is just a yes or no, uh, the risk of diabetes was higher, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, osteoporosis, and cataracts, right? So all of those bad things can happen with the steroids. That's why in clinic, we have to be thinking of good alternatives, as I showed you in that previous slide. And here's one good alternative for pulmonary sarcoidosis. This was a nice study published uh, 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 recently in CHEST, and uh, it still used the steroids, but oral steroids only for three months, and then 15 months of inhaled steroids, very similarly to what we do in asthma, for example, right? 
And we saw good results in this uh, trial. X-ray got better, breathing test got better. So here's one good strategy for pulmonary sarcoidosis, uh, inhaled steroids and not oral steroids. If those things don't work, if the second line agents don't work like methotrexate and, and leflunamide, we also have the third line options, as I mentioned, infliximab, for example, is one of them. And this is probably the biggest randomized controlled trial in pulmonary sarcoidosis using infliximab. And what we can see here in the left side is that the breathing tests got better. This is the FVC or the force vital capacity getting better with infliximab. And in the right side here, this is a uh, score that we use to, to, to measure how active is the extra pulmonary disease. Um, so the lower the score, the better. And those uh, dark circles here, those are patients on infliximab. So you, as you can see here, the extra pulmonary sarcoidosis was also getting better on infliximab. So another great option to use if things are not working. And then my last slide is, for how long do we treat, right? You made the decision to treat pulmonary sarcoidosis. You're trying to avoid steroids. You're using methotrexate or infliximab. But for how long should you treat? The best data comes from this Italian study from 1998. And they show that at least two years of therapy was necessary. Even after those two years, once we stopped, there was a 30% chance of relapse, right? So definitely not less than two years we say at least two years of therapy once we made the decision to treat. After two years, it's a case-by-case -case discussion with patients. Sometimes we stop it, sometimes we keep it going. With that, I'll stop here. Uh, I think I went one minute uh, above my time, but I know that those virtual meetings are great because people can join from all over the place. This is amazing, but I hope that Anytime soon, we can get together here in Cleveland and you can see how beautiful, beautiful Cleveland is. This is a nice picture of downtown Cleveland. This is Lake Erie. And this is how sunny uh, Cleveland is uh, all year around. <laughs> so with that, I'll stop here and uh, I'm happy to take questions through the chat or after the talks. Thank you, Dr. Riberio. That was excellent. Again, folks, if you have questions for Dr. Riberio, go ahead and drop them in your Q&A section. We'll also have time for Q&A after. And it's my pleasure to uh, hand this, the driving ticket over to Dr. Vidula. Oh, Dr. Vidula, you're on mute. Um, so thank you, Mindy, for that um, nice introduction. And thank you, Dr. Ribeiro, for a wonderful talk. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about cardiac sarcoidosis. Just an introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about diagnosis, treatment, and next steps. So first, a little bit about sarcoidosis. So clinically manifest. So that means people who have clinical symptoms of cardiac involvement is present in about 25% of patients who have extra cardiac sarcoids, so sarcoid in other parts of their body. However, we know that we underdiagnose cardiac sarcoidosis because in autopsy studies, cardiac involvement is present in up to 70% of patients who have sarcoidosis in other parts of the body. And we also have to remember that about 25% of patients who have cardiac sarcoid may have isolated cardiac sarcoid, which means they only have it in the heart and not in other parts of the body. One of the funny things about cardiac involvement is that it can occur before or after or at the same time as involvement in other organs. So because of all of these facts, the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis can be very tricky. So when you have cardiac involvement with sarcoidosis, what are we looking for? So patients can have abnormal heart rhythms and they can have slow heart rhythms that we call conduction abnormalities. They can also have very fast rhythms and we particularly worry about rhythms called ventricular arrhythmias, which are fast heart rhythms that come from the bottom, the pumping chambers of the heart. And finally, patients can have heart failure meaning that the heart is not pumping normally. The ejection fraction of the heart, which is a measure of the pumping capability, is decreased, and patients can develop shortness of breath, swelling in their belly, swelling in their legs, and other symptoms. So how do we look for cardiac sarcoidosis, and who should we be looking for it in? 
So if patients have no known history of sarcoidosis and they have an abnormal cardiac MRI or PET scan, we, we will do these tests if any of the following are present. So if we have a patient who has advanced heart block, conduction abnormality, slow heart rhythms, and they're less than 60 years old, that's when we start thinking about sarcoidosis. If someone has sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, which means that they have these abnormal rhythms that I described in the previous slide, but they last for 30 seconds or longer, then we start thinking about sarcoidosis. Or if they have developed heart failure or cardiomyopathy for no known reason, then we start thinking about sarcoidosis. And that's the point where we'll think about doing a cardiac MRI or a PET scan, which I will describe in the follow-up slides. So what about people who do have extra cardiac sarcoid, meaning they have sarcoid in other parts of the body? When should we be worried about cardiac involvement? And when should we get a cardiac MRI or a PET scan? So when all patients who have sarcoidosis should be asked about palpitations or passing out syncope at least once a year. And then if they have those symptoms and they have an abnormal EKG or an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, that's when we are worried that they may have involvement of the heart with sarcoidosis and should get either a cardiac MRI or a PET scan. So the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid is very tricky and different groups have created different criteria for making the diagnosis. And this is a very busy slide. You don't need to memorize all of this, but there's really two different ways of making that diagnosis in someone that you're worried about that might have cardiac involvement. So one is to get a biopsy of heart tissue, but getting a biopsy of heart tissue can be very difficult. Even in people who definitely have cardiac involvement, we only find it about 30% of time after we do a biopsy. And the reason for this is that sarcoid involvement in the heart is very patchy. There's just very sparse areas that are affected, which can make it difficult to make the diagnosis using a biopsy. So because of that, we try to combine different criteria and add them up and see if that gives us a prob higher probability of having cardiac involvement. So what are some of those criteria? So we look to see if people have biopsy proven sarcoidosis in other parts of their body, and we look at for other symptoms. So if they have those, this heart block, these slow heart rhythms, fast heart rhythms called ventricular tachycardia, heart dysfunction with a ejection fraction, a pumping fraction of the heart that's reduced, or if they have these things and we give a patient steroids and things get better, that also suggests that they might have sarcoidosis. So we look at all these different criteria along with cardiac MRI findings and PET scan findings and try to determine the probability of somebody having cardiac involvement. The Japanese Circulation Society has some different criteria, and this is criteria for patients who may not have any involvement of other body parts, but may have the so-called isolated cardiac sarcoid. And in those cases, we look at the PET scan findings, and then we also look at the same, some of the same things we looked at in the previous slide, conduction abnormalities, slow heart rhythms, abnormal functioning of the heart on an echocardiogram and ultrasound, abnormalities on the PET scan, MRI, abnormalities on an EKG, abnormalities on a nuclear scan. So we look at all of these, try to add them up and determine the probability of someone having cardiac involvement. So we talked a lot about MRI. So what exactly are we looking at on an MRI to determine if someone has cardiac involvement? So if somebody had sarcoidosis, on the MRI, we can see scarring or we can see swelling or edema, and that can cause the pictures to light up. So here on the bottom, you see someone who has a normal heart, and this is a heart cut in slices like an orange. So you here see here that this is all dark, this is all normal. Then you here, you have someone who has just kind of one area that's affected by sarcoidosis. So there's an area here that could be scar or could be a little bit of swelling, edema in the heart. This is someone else who had multiple areas of the heart affected. So you see some brightness here, brightness here, brightness here. And finally, this is someone who has very extensive involvement. So the heart has become thinned out. You see that this orange slice is a lot thinner than compared to this one, which is normal and thicker. So here, this is all thinned out, all brightened. This is probably all extensive scarring from the sarcoidosis. 
So what about PET scans? So PET scans are different from cardiac MRIs. And in PET scans, patients receive a weak radioactive tracer. And this tracer called FDG connects itself to glucose particles and is retained within cells that have high metabolic activity. And those cells within granulomas, which Dr. Ribeiro spoke about in his talk, they have very high activity. And so they light up. And before you do a test like this, you will often be told to follow a special high fat diet followed by fasting. And it's very important to follow all the rules of this diet to avoid any false positive cases and to make sure you get a really good scan result. And we can do PET scans, not just to diagnose sarcoidosis, but also after treatment with steroids or other medications to determine if, the medic if, if your body is responding to the medications and if the degree of inflammation in the heart from the sarcoidosis is improving. So this is a picture from a PET scan. This is again, heart, the heart cut into slices like an orange. And you can see that there's some parts of the heart that are lighting up. And these are the areas that are probably affected by active inflammation from the sarcoidosis. Whereas there's other darker areas in the heart that are not being affected. So when, a, when patients get a PET scan, their physician will not only think about sarcoidosis, but also think about other things that could cause similar findings. So it's always important for us to think about other things that could cause similar findings and make sure that we have enough of that criteria that I described in the previous slide that add up to make, it, make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And then finally, like I said before, we can also do biopsies. And so in cases where despite all the different types of imaging tests and other tests really not able to make a diagnosis, we will often perform a biopsy. And if we're lucky, we can find a granuloma similar to doc what Dr. Ribeiro showed you in his slide set. So now let's talk a little bit about treatment. So for treat cardiac sarcoidosis, we use some of the same medications that Dr. Ribeiro described in his talk. And the reason we give these medications is that immunosuppression, bringing down the immune system, can reduce that burden of inflammation that you saw on that PET scan, all that stuff lighting up, and prevent scarring of the heart and further deterioration of the cardiac structure and fu function. And I described previously that PET scan is probably the best suited type of imaging modality for determining the need for treatment. So if things are lighting up on the PET scan and everything else fits the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, that's when we'll often start treatment for cardiac patients. And it's also good for monitoring the response to therapy. So after someone has been on medications for three to six months, that's when we will think about repeating that PET scan and seeing what has happened and whether that inflammation has improved. So the first line therapy really is steroids. And in these patients, the reason we give steroids is to see if that can improve those conduction abnormalities, those slow heart rhythms, and if they can, that can also improve the function of the heart if the heart function is reduced. But in patients who have very severely reduced heart function, so a left ventricular ejection fraction, which is a measure of how much that pumping chamber is doing, less than 30%, steroids are less likely to help improve the size of the left ventricle and the pumping fraction, the ejection fraction of that ventricle. And we also don't really under, completely understand the effects of steroids on abnormal heart rhythms. So often patients will be on other medications specifically for the abnormal heart rhythms in addition to steroids. So other treatments that we can use, and sometimes we, we, we often start these at the same time as the steroid therapy, sometimes a little later. So one is mycophenolate mofetil, Celsept, another is methotrexate, a third one is azathioprine. And then in cases that may not be responding to these treatments, we will think about using medications such as infliximab. So often in patients who have cardiac involvement, they're just not, they're not only on medications that help get rid of the inflammation that's related to the sarcoidosis. So not just steroids or some of the other medications that I mentioned, but they're often also on medications that help improve the pumping function of the heart. So often patients may be on these other medications and you may recognize some of the names. So Entresto, Lysinopril, Losartan, these are some of the medications in the first group 
Patients may be on beta blockers, such as metoprolol or carvedilol. They may be on aldosterone antagonist medications, such as spironolactone or emplerinone. And they may also be on these other newer medications called SGLT2 inhibitors called Farsiga. And so all of these medications, these, this group of four medications helps improve heart function in patients who have sarcoidosis that has led to abnormalities in the pumping function of the heart. Patients may also need medications such as Lasix, which is a diuretic to help get rid of fluid. And they may also need medications, as I mentioned in the previous slide, for abnormal heart rhythms, such, such as amiodarone. So not only do we treat patients who have cardiac involvement with medications, but some patients may also need a defibrillator, which is a type of pacemaker that not only can pace the heart if necessary, if someone's having slow heart rhythms, but if you have those abnormal fast heart rhythms called ventricular tachycardia, it can detect that abnormal rhythm and give you a shock and save your life. So when do we think about implanting these ICDs or implantable cardioverter defibrillators? We look at different criteria again. So in cardiology, we have a lot of criteria. So we look to see if somebody has spontaneous ventricular tachycardia, which means they're having spontaneous abnormal heart rhythms that are very fast, or if they have very low heart function despite being on treatment. Um, and if somebody has very low heart function, we worry that they could develop these abnormal heart rhythms, that they're a higher risk of developing these rhythms, and that we need to be more aggressive about protecting them with the, with the defibrillator. We also think about implanting a defibrillator in patients who require a pacemaker because they have slow heart rhythms, patients who have passed out, and we think that it's probably due to an abnormal heart rhythm and they have sarcoidosis, and then patients who have very severely reduced abnormal heart rhythms, even if they haven't had a trial of medical therapy, often we will give them a defibrillator to protect them. So how do we figure out how a patient with cardiac sarcoid might respond to therapy and how they might they do in the long term? One of the most important things we look at is the function, the pumping function of the heart. So in patients who have very severe left ventricular dysfunction, those patients are the ones that we worry more that they may have abnormal heart rhythms or other events may occur. And those are the patients that, as I described in the previous slide, that we really think about being assertive about placing a defibrillator. And also in certain cases, and this is rare, but in certain cases, thinking about things like heart transplant or also something called a mechanical heart pump called a left ventricular assist device. So that was a lot of information, but in conclusion, when we're thinking about cardiac sarcoid, we have to really require a high index of clinical suspicion because as I showed you in the first slide, we know that we underdiagnose it. So we have to always be thinking about it in the back of our head, particularly in patients who may have abnormal heart rhythms or palpitations or other abnormalities. We can use a lot of different types of imaging techniques such as PET scans and MRIs to diagnose it and to also monitor how it responds to treatment. And treatment includes immunosuppression, so medications to bring down the immune system and get rid of that inflammation from the sarcoidosis. Medical therapies for heart failure, so medications that help improve the pumping function of the heart and help patients live longer. And in very rare cases, thinking about surgical treatments like heart transplant or LVADs. And because this is so complicated, we really use a large team to manage these complex patients. And in our team, we have a number of different specialists from different areas who all come together to help take care and manage patients with sarcoidosis. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vidula, for that excellent presentation. I know we already have some questions in the, in the Q&A box. If you're able to answer that during the next session, that'd be great, some of those. Um, so folks, just do know if you have added your question to the Q&A box, those are being answered as we go along. Of course, we'll also have Q&A at the end of the session, but we have these great presentations. Want to make sure we get all through them. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandon Moss uh, for our next session. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Mindy. Um, let me uh, go ahead and get right to it. I'm just going to share my screen here. Just a second. Share my screen. screen. 
And can you see my presentation there? We certainly can. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so like Mindy uh, said, I'm going to give a talk on neurologic complications of sarcoidosis. Um, real quick, you know, in terms of disclosures, I have stock in Pfizer and I've received consulting fees for Biogen and I get research support from Genentech and Novartis, but that shouldn't really have much of an impact on what I'm talking about today. So in brief, um, we're going to go over um, sort of a 30,000 foot view of um, neurologic complications of sarcoidosis, um, talk about the disease manifestations, um, talk about a general approach to diagnosis and treatment, and then I'll, I'll give some discussion of the associated syndromes that uh, Dr. Um, Riverio had mentioned earlier, like um, pain, fatigue, and cognitive symptoms. All right, in terms of the overview, so about 5 to 15% of sarcoidosis uh, cases have involvement of the nervous system. Uh, this may be an underrepresentation, like um, Dr. Fadula was mentioning in autopsy studies. Uh, there appear to be more people with nervous system involvement than um, was recognized clinically. Um, neurosarcoidosis, even though it affects a minority of people with sarcoidosis, is one of the main contributors to long term disability and mortality in the disease, in part because of um, the, the um, essential function of the, the structures that it affects. And eventually 80 to 90% of sarco uh, neurosarcoidosis cases have some detectable disease, some detectable sarcoidosis outside the nervous system, um, but only 50% of those um, have detectable disease outside the nervous system at the time of presentation. And we'll talk more about why that's important, but it does make diagnosis difficult, which is largely based on biopsy. This is just a brief overview of the parts of the nervous system here. Um, so it just shows you that um, in central um, nervous system involves the brain and the spine. Um, and then you've got nerves coming off of it, which make up the peripheral nervous system. Um, if it's coming off the brain, they're the cranial nerves. Off the spine, they're the spinal nerves. And then you've got another uh, component to the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system that is important for automatic processes of the body, like um, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and that can be affected indirectly in sarcoidosis as well. So in terms of the clinical manifestations, um, sarcoidosis can pretty much affect any part of the nervous system, uh, but most commonly involves the cranial nerves, those nerves coming off of the brain, and the meninges, or the covering of the brain. Other presentations that we see with some frequency include uh, brain lesions, involvement of the pituitary gland, which produces uh, certain hormones. Um, the spinal cord uh, can be involved. And then peripheral nerve involvement and muscle involvement as well. Um, the most common cranial nerve affected is the facial nerve that controls strength in the face. And um, presentation can include difficulty with closing the eye, an asymmetric smile or sagging face. Um, on the right, um, you've got a picture of the brain in cross section, and the arrow is pointing to um, some bright signal representing inflammation involving the facial nerve. Um, facial nerve palsy develops in, you know, up to 40% of people with neurologic complications of sarcoidosis. It can be one side of the face or both. Um, and generally, people make a full recovery, um, even if they don't have any treatment. So uh, as things go, this is considered one of the more mild manifestations of um, neurosarcoidosis. Um, optic nerve involvement is the second most common cranial nerve involved. It happens in um, up to a third of people with neurologic complications of sarcoidosis. Usually presents with pain, with eye movement, blurry vision, or loss of vision. Um, and sometimes color vision is more affected than the other components to vision. Um, some people have significant improvement with treatment, but others have long lasting symptoms. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see there's a cross section of the brain again, this time with an arrow pointing to inflammation involving the nerve to the eye or the optic nerve. And on the right, you'll see a picture of the back of the eye, which shows swelling of the optic nerve, which is also indicative of inflammation. Other cranial nerves can be evolved as well, which can lead to symptoms like vertigo or hearing loss, loss of feeling in the face, double vision, hoarseness, 
and difficulty swallowing. And this is just a slide that shows you some of the different manifestations of central nervous system involvement. So in the far left, um, we see uh, a meningitis or inflammation of the covering of the brain, um, noted by all of those little bright squiggly lines along the surface. Um, it typically affects the lower portions of the brain more than the upper portions, as you can see here. Um, and most people present with symptoms that develop you know, over days to weeks, um, sometimes a little bit longer. It tends to affect the base of the brain, like I mentioned before, and can lead to problems with the pituitary gland and hormone production. Um, in severe cases, it can block absorption of brain fluid, leading to increased pressure in the brain, which can be very serious and might require a shunt to drain the fluid. Um, but more commonly, it causes things like headaches that don't go away, uh, nausea and vomiting, especially headaches that get worse when you lie down, sometimes some problems with thinking or problems with um, balance and walking. If it progresses, um, which the, the middle case shows, you can get um, infiltration of the inflammation into the brain tissue itself. Um, and so you can see uh, on the middle slide that there are some uh, sort of bright squiggly lines, um, which are adjacent to these little darker, well, darker, brighter um, sort of circular blobs. And, and that represents inflammation that's invading the brain along vascular roots. And that's typically what we expect to see with brain lesions from sarcoidosis. Um, symptoms depend upon the area of the brain that's involved. And um, it can lead to uh, seizures in some people um, if, if the appropriate areas of the brain are, are irritated. And then on the right, we see spinal cord involvement from uh, sarcoidosis. Again, much like the brain typically um, occurs along the covering of the spinal cord with an invasion in, and um, you can see sort of the spinal cord falling down and the arrows are pointing to the, uh, the bright areas of inflammation. Spinal cord involvement includes things like uh, numbness and weakness in the extremities, uh, problems with bowel and bladder function, and difficulty walking. And then the peripheral nerves can be involved too. Um, this in occurs in, in fewer people than central nervous system involvement um, and can include nerve root injury as well as a peripheral neuropathy. Um, I've got some slides here showing uh, the peripheral nerves, is, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the nerve roots as they're affected. In the far left, um, you see some of the, the nerves coming off of the, the nerve roots coming off of the spinal cord or lighting up, um, which indicates inflammation. And just to the right of that, you can see them um, in cross section, the little dots are the areas of inflamed nerves and, and they're a little bit enlarged as well. And then on the right hand side, um, you can see the nerve roots coming off of the, the spinal cord in the neck. Uh, arrows are pointing to the bright areas that represent inflammation. And on the very far right, you can see in cross section those nerves as well. Um, one key point, peripheral neuropathy in sarcoidosis is typically a little bit different than other causes of peripheral neuropathy, like di diabetes. Um, in diabetes, you usually have symmetry between the two sides of the body. So the right is similarly affected to the left. And it's usually what's termed length dependent, um, meaning that the longest nerves in the body, those going down all the way to the toes, um, are affected before the nerves higher up, like those going down to the hands. Um, in sarcoidosis, things tend to be a little asymmetric, so different between one side of the body and the other, and it often doesn't have that same um, length-dependent pattern, which can be a, a clue that something else is going on. In terms of diagnosis, much like for other manifestations of sarcoidosis, um, our level of confidence is in large part based on our ability to get a biopsy and see evidence of sarcoidosis on the microscope. So the lowest level of confidence, the lowest diagnostic certainty would be um, having a characteristic presentation of sarcoidosis um, with confirmatory tests that suggest sarcoidosis. The next level up would be um, getting biopsy tissue in other parts of the body, usually the lungs, because that's commonly affected, that shows evidence of sarcoidosis. 
with confirmatory tests involving um, the nervous system that suggest that sarcoidosis is affecting those areas as well. And then the highest level of certainty, that little top of the pyramid would be biopsy tissue of the nervous system itself um, that shows evidence of sarcoidosis. Um, while the goal is obtaining biopsy proof of sarcoidosis in the nervous system, um, nervous system tissue may not be readily available, or we may be concerned about injury, um, especially to areas like the brain or spine, if we were to get a biopsy. And in those cases, if we have um, biopsy proof of sarcoidosis in area, other areas with characteristic tests um, suggesting involvement of, of the nervous system, then um, nervous system involvement is typically assumed. So in terms of a general approach to treatment, um, symptomatic disease, especially involving the brain and spine, is associated with a lot of uh, long-term disability and um, requires uh, really early effective treatment to um, prevent that from happening. Uh, some people advocate dividing uh, neurosarcoidosis into three categories mild manifestations of disease, moderate manifestations of disease, and severe manifestations of disease based on the presenting features, and then um, tailoring the treatment uh, to those different manifestations. So for example, if you had facial nerve palsy, which is expected to um, get better in the vast majority of people, you might do um, a prednisone burst and taper over a few months and not start a long-term um, immune therapy in those people uh, because you don't expect long-term complications, where if you had um, brain lesions or spine lesions, um, generally you're doing steroids um, plus a steroid sparing medication, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, plus a TNF-alpha blocker, which Dr. Ribeiro mentioned as well, um, and we really try and hit things um, with multiple different therapies um, and then get the steroids off quickly because they have more issues with long-term side effects. So like I mentioned before, general principles of treatment, steroids are the first line therapy because they work so quickly, uh, but because they have so many side effects, we try and get them off as quickly as possible once other therapies are in place that can help control inflammation from sarcoidosis. Um, in order to do that, we have certain steroid sparing medications or cytotoxic drugs uh, like methotrexate and azathioprine um, that can be used to limit the dose and duration of steroids uh, for people with moderate to severe disease manifestations. And then for people with severe disease manifestations, we're usually also starting a TNF alpha blocker. So those would be medications like infliximab and adalimumab. Um, and they can also be used in people who have persistent disease despite starting a medication like methotrexate or azathioprine if people just aren't responding. Um, in terms of side effects, so uh, for maintenance therapies for neurosarcoidosis, prednisone has a lot of side effects, including weight gain, diabetes, risk for certain rare infections, um, like pneumocystis, which is a, a rare uh, pneumonia, and osteoporosis. And so we really try and limit those as, as, as much as we can, um, although that's not always possible. Um, for medications like azathioprine and methotrexate, they have um, side effects as well. Um, usually the, the tolerability issues come from GI side effects like nausea um, and stomach upset. Um, and methotrexate, you can get some elevated liver enzymes sometimes. Um, in azathioprine, we have to watch out for drops in blood counts when we first start the medication. Um, and azathioprine might carry a slight increased risk of skin cancer and um, some blood cancers in certain patient populations. Both azathioprine and methotrexate are not used um, during pregnancy because they can have um, serious side effects for the unborn child. And so, you know, we want to make sure that those medications are off for approximately six months um, before you start trying to get pregnant. 
And then for infliximab and adalimumab, these have been really effective therapies for people with neurologic complications of sarcoidosis, especially severe ones that can cause long-term issues. Um, they do carry increased risk of um, some serious infections, uh, including fungal infections, and you can sometimes get reactivation of tuberculosis or hepatitis B if you've been exposed to those in the past. Um, they can cause allergic reactions, sometimes severe, uh, and in certain populations can be associated with an increased risk of blood cancers. In addition, for adalimumab, we get really careful in people who have a history of heart failure because um, they could lead to uh, more issues and, um, and it's generally not started if, if someone has a history of, of heart-related complications. Um, duration of treatment, like Dr. Uh, Riberio mentioned, um, is, is uh, something that we're still trying to fully understand. Um, just to give you a, a general idea, about half of people with all manifestations of sarcoidosis have remission within a few years, and about two-thirds have remission within 10 years. Um, so it doesn't look like, you know, lifelong therapy is necessary for everybody. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're controlling the inflammation. Um, and so it may be possible for neurologic complications to wean off some of the therapies with more serious long-term risks after one to two years of proven disease stability. Um, I won't go too much into detail here, but um, associated syndromes that we see with sarcoidosis include things like small fiber nerve injury, which can cause a burning pain or pins and needles pain, sweating abnormalities, lightheadedness when getting out of bed or standing up, um, and some GI problems like uh, feeling full early after starting a meal, nausea, vomiting, bloating, and constipation. You can get fatigue. Um, that's associated with disease and some cognitive symptoms, usually related to things like concentration, complex decision making, problems with recall, um, more executive function type issues. Uh, these are not due to direct granulomatous inflammation, and so they don't respond typically to the traditional treatments for sarcoidosis. A lot of what we do in terms of management is really supportive care and trying to identify anything that might be contributing to those symptoms and fix that. Um, I'll skip over this for the time being since we're running a little short on time and just go over the major key points here. So the sarcoidosis is variable from person to person and can affect any part of the nervous system, but most commonly involve the cranial nerves and the meninges. Uh, confidence in the diagnosis is higher for people with biopsy proven disease, but biopsy may not be possible at presentation for a lot of people with neurologic complications. So you have to have a high index of suspicion when someone comes in. And uh, quick control of inflammation is the best way that we know of to minimize long-term disability. Um, we have to balance the risks and benefits of treatment. And so trying to minimize the dose and duration of steroids is important. And we consider weaning therapies with long-term side effects after about one to two years of disease stability. And then management of other complications like small fiber nerve injury, cognitive symptoms and fatigue is primarily focused on symptom management and identifying um, contributing factors. So I'll go ahead and open it up for any questions that you guys have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moss. Um, and I would also like to invite uh, Dr. Vadula and Dr. Riberio back. Um, I know they've been very busy on the Q&A section. Both of them have. So thank you for that. Um, because of that, I do want to, I know that we have at least one question in here um, related to um, neurosarcoidosis. So one patient has says they've been having less bladder control ever since being diagnosed with pulmonary sarcoidosis. They've never had this before. Could this be related? It, certainly bladder complications can be a manifestation of neurologic complications of sarcoidosis. Um, generally, we look at the clinical context to, to help figure out how likely that is because bladder symptoms can happen for a variety of reasons. You know, if you've had multiple pregnancies, you, you might also have some bladder symptoms. So it's important to figure out if you've got other things that are associated with either issues with small fiber neuropathy, which can be associated with bladder symptoms, or spine involvement, which can be associated with bladder symptoms as well. So if you had issues with strength in the legs, numbness and tingling, problems with balance, 
and bladder issues, I would be concerned about the spinal cord and would get imaging of the spinal cord. Great, thank you. So the, um, I just, we, we are out of time. <laughs> and I know that uh, if, if anybody has a question, um, specifically for Dr. Moss, because he hadn't given his presentation yet, um, uh, go ahead and drop that in there. But um, we will go ahead and send the recording of this session out to folks within two working days, generally. Um, and uh, we will make sure that everybody gets that. Um, so with that, I do want to thank all of our experts today. So thank you, Dr. Moss, Dr. Riberio, Dr. Vidula, for your amazing presentations. It's been truly excellent. And thank you all for working on the Q&A as well. Um, so as a reminder for everyone, we do value each and every one of you, uh, your opinions. We love receiving feedback about our webinars. So please complete the super quick survey for this webinar. For those of you who are using Zoom in a browser, it should automatically take you there once you leave the webinar. If not, um, I've added it to the chat here. Actually, gotta, gotta put that in the chat before I say I've added it to the chat. Um, uh, so, Sorry, guys, let me just actually pick that up here. There you go. Um, and additionally, uh, I want to remind folks that we have our third annual virtual education summit for patients and caregivers um, on July 30, 30th and 31st. Um, so we'll be bringing together experts to share more information about sarcoidosis, as well as provide a robust platform for virtual networking uh, with your fellow patients and supporters. Registration is open now, and that link is also in the chat. Um, also, if you haven't already, please join the FSR community to stay updated on news and events and information uh, about sarcoidosis, including clinical trial opportunities. And finally, we must also thank our donors for their continued support of FSR. Uh, we cannot provide programming such as this webinar without support of our generous donors. If you'd like to help us ensure this kind of programming remains free of charge for all patients and their supporters, we hope you consider supporting FSR. We have a variety of ways to show your support and you can find out more via the link also added in the chat or visiting our website. So once again, thank you to our amazing experts and to all of you for coming today and attending this session. We really appreciate it. And again, we will send out the recording of this um, in the post-event email. Good night. Thank you very much, Mindy, for organizing this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you. Great thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks.